그래. 여다 다 쏟아내고 가라. 그 가가 흘리는 것만 싫다. 아이고, 내 새끼 어쩌 그거 승산한대요. In Busan, 1915, a woman named Yang Jin tells the local shaman her three previous children all died before their first year of life was over. Hearing this, the shaman performs a ritual and announces that her daughter will live, giving rise to future generations of their family. In New York, 1989, a sharply dressed Solomon Bake is being passed over for a promotion to VP he was promised at Shifley's, a prestigious multinational firm. However, he knows that a huge contract for a hotel chain is being blocked by just one Korean landowner in Tokyo. As a Korean born in Japan himself, Solomon promises that he can find a way to close the deal if they guarantee the promotion upon his success. In 1920s Busan, a 10-year-old Sunja Yangjin's daughter walks through a thriving fish market. When Japanese officers show up, they reveal the underlying tension in the occupied port city. That night, her father Hyun has dinner with a few of the men who rent rooms with them. Their talk soon grows dark when they wonder what more the Japanese might take from them. One of them even begins to talk about killing the Japanese occupiers. When the dinner is over, Yang Jin worries they will be arrested for talk like that under their roof. However, her husband doesn't think there's anything to worry about. Sun Jia overhears her parents arguing and becomes fearful for her family's future. She tells the renter to leave, who subsequently disappears. The Japanese police arrive to question the family about the renter and wonder why they didn't report his dangerous comments before he left. Fortunately, the family is only given a warning. However, not long after, Sun Jia witnesses the Japanese police capturing the renter. They mistreat him while he defiantly sings a Korean drinking song. Solomon arrives in Osaka, Japan, and reunites with his father, Mosasu, at his pachinko parlor, informing his father that he is back in Japan to secure a promotion. He later meets his grandmother, Sun Jia, at her house, where Etsuko, his father's girlfriend, arrives and compliments him. Solomon goes into a bedroom and opens a box that triggers memories of Hana, his former love interest, and Etsuko's missing daughter, with Etsuko having hired a private detective to find her. Later, Solomon reaches the Shifley's Tokyo office and is shown to his office. While there, he and the office receive news that Emperor Horohito, who ruled Japan during the Japanese occupation of Korea, has passed away at the age of 87. Back in 1920s Korea, Sunja's father passes away from tuberculosis. Overwhelmed by grief, Sunja immerses herself in the waters of a cove. Nine years later, a new fish market broker named Han Su arrives in town, dressed in a flashy white suit. He becomes captivated by Sun Jia when he sees her at the market. Eventually, their eyes meet, marking the beginning of a significant connection between Han Su and Sun Jia. In 1989, Solomon is seated with his new boss, the American Tom, who is there with their Japanese co-worker Naomi. Sharing a moment, Naomi discovers she shares a similar past with Solomon, both having lived in America. She mentions the guessing game, where Americans try to guess which Asian she is. Thankfully, she says, Japanese is usually second. Korea is usually not even in the top four, Solomon replies. Meanwhile, in Osaka, the older Sun Jia is caring for her sister-in-law, Kyung Hee. She asks whether Sun Jia regretted the choice she made in the past with that man, and if she ever wondered what would have happened had she chosen differently. At the office, Tom, Solomon, and Naomi discuss strategy regarding the Korean landowner deal. Later, Tom begins talking about his stagnating position in the company. He blames it on his marriage, which led him to lose focus on work. His wife eventually left him anyway, so it was a lose-lose situation. Meanwhile, Solomon's father asks a young mechanic to slightly rig the machines. He then meets a woman from the bank with documents for a 400 million yen loan for a new parlor, with construction probably beginning in a few weeks. Back in 1931, Sun Jia is harassed by a group of young men as she is leaving the market. 
The majority of them take her into a side room, but one runs away to get help. Han Su comes to the rescue and makes them apologize. Then, Sun Jia and Han Su share a sweet moment on the ferry together. She offers to meet him by the cove the next day and see how things go in their budding relationship. In Tokyo, Solomon brings a gift to the Korean landlady, Gyum Jia. It's a square watermelon that he says tastes awful, but is worth 9,000 yen. She scoffs at this. He mentions that she bought this property for 4,000 yen, less than half that, and now they are willing to give her 1 billion yen. She stares at him, then tells him a sad story about the history of her family and why she doesn't respect his offer. Ultimately, she rejects his watermelon and storms inside. At his home, Mosasu reveals to Etsuko that he was informed by the detective, who had told him that Hana had been seen eight months ago, working with many clients, implying that she has been prostituting. Solomon then gets a call from Hana and tells him that she's in the darkness now and doesn't see a way out. He tells Hana her mother has been looking for her, but Hana threatens him with no contact if he says anything to her mother. He wants to know why she left, to which she replies that it was he who left for America first. In the past, Han Su speaks with Sun Jia, as she is cleaning clothes in the river and starts drawing a map of Japan onto a large boulder nearby and points out where he lives. He spins an enchanting story of the wonders of the big city before expanding it to the world. She asks what America is like. He answers, everything and nothing. Seeing Korea and Japan on his map, she is surprised they're about the same size. She had always imagined Japan as a much larger mouth, swallowing them, but now she feels they could beat them. He then tells Sun Jia that before he moved to Japan and became successful, he was poor in Korea. Having spent most of the day together, they finally share an intimate moment. Back in Osaka, Sun Jia finds Kyung Hee dead in bed when she goes to serve her breakfast. They cremate her, with Sun Jia later collecting her ashes. Back at home, Sun Jia reminisces about how Kyung Hee was so important in raising her children, as she was too busy with work. Solomon then mentions that the landlady rejected his offer, and Sun Jia replies that some people just can't let go of the past. Finally, Solomon suggests her coming back to Tokyo to live with him. In the past, Sun Jia gets morning sickness and continues her relationship with Han Su, in which he gives her an expensive watch. Afterward, she reveals to him that she is pregnant. Hesitant at first, Han Su tells her that he's happy with the news. However, when she then mentions marriage, he tells her that he has a wife and three daughters back in Osaka. Nevertheless, he proposes a secret relationship with even more children. But Sun Jia is heartbroken and insulted and walks away. At the same time, a sick man arrives on the ferry, carrying two suitcases. He walks to Sun Jia's home in the rain just as Sun Jia arrives and collapses in their yard. After having carried him inside, they learn that his name is Isak Bek and is a pastor. Some time later, Sun Jia reveals to her mother that she's pregnant, and they cry together over it, not knowing that the recovering Isak overhears them. In 1989 Tokyo, Solomon and Sun Jia visit Gyeong Jia and are invited in for dinner. When Sun Jia tastes her rice, she immediately notices it's from Korea and smiles, whereas Solomon can't tell the difference. The landlady and Sun Jia then reminisce about how the Japanese took their white rice and so this earthy rice was all they had. This experience helps Sun Jia realize it's too late for Kyung Hee to see Korea again, but not too late for herself. The landlady then accuses Solomon of using his grandmother to persuade her. He responds that although he brought Sun Jia here to help convince her, the deal is a great offer, and she should take it anyways, for the financial freedom of her and her children. Back at the office, Tom congratulates Solomon on getting the deal as he just got off the phone with Gyum Jia. Solomon is shocked, but the office celebrates with drinks nonetheless. However, Hana then calls him again. He asks when he will see her, and she says probably never, before coughing violently. Returning home, the older Sun Jia rushes into the pachinko parlor. She excitedly tells Mosasu that she must return to Korea because it's important to scatter Kyung Hee's ashes there. To allow Isak to deliver a message to his parents, Yang Jin has Sun Jia accompany him to town. At the dock, they see Han Su, who angrily stares at them. Sometime later, Isak and Sun Jia are having dinner at a nice restaurant in town. He reveals to her that he knows about her child. 
He asks if she's considered giving up the child for adoption, as he knows she'll be an outcast as a single mom. Soon Jia recounts that her father, too, was told he couldn't have a family. But look at how she turned out. So, she wants to try, too. Isak then asks if she could forget the man who left her and be with another. And she says she wants to try to forget him. He asks if maybe there's another man she could love, to which she nods. In 1931, Isak is confronted by Han Su in a haberdashery. Hansu talks down on him and, as a final insult, offers to pay for a new suit. But a proud Isak rejects his offer and tells him that he can buy his own suits. Some time later, Isak, Sun Jia, and Yang Jin meet secretly with a pastor, and he criticizes Sun Jia for her decisions, saying she has caused a dark blight upon herself, her mother, and now Isak. But even so, he will marry them. After the market the following day, Sun Jia is taken to Hansu's office by a Japanese officer. He scolds her for marrying Isak, telling her she is delusional. He says Hasak can't support her, while he can. Sun Jia responds that he didn't support her at all, and in fact shamed her instead. Together with Isak, Sun Jia says heartfelt goodbyes to the boarders, her mother, and the servant girls before she and Isak leave for Osaka. Before boarding the ship, Sun Jia is gifted two rings by her mother for her marriage but Sun Jia passes them back, giving her mother the watch Han Su had gifted her instead. However, her mother cannot accept it and passes the whole lot back. Sun Jia cries into her mother's shoulder, and she says farewell. On the ship, a Korean opera singer pauses her Japanese song abruptly, then begins a different one in Korean. The Koreans on the lower deck can hear her and pound the hole with excitement, while the Japanese in first class call to drag her off the stage. After a moment, the opera singer reveals a hidden knife and suddenly stabs her own neck, choosing death over subjugation. Back in 1989, Solomon enters the Tokyo office and sees Naomi there early, confronting her about her affair with Tom. She tells him about how a Japanese company becomes one's family. She chose Shifley's, a lower-tier company in Japan, because although she's accomplished as a woman, she thought it better to be surrounded by less accomplished men. Soon after, Gyomja arrives at Shifley's for the contract signing. She takes out her glasses to look over the contract carefully as a room full of professionally dressed people looks on. She then starts telling how she came to Japan with her mother a few years after her father, who worked in the mines. They performed a strike because of the terrible living conditions, but in 20 days, they were all fired. No one would rent to Koreans. They were too dirty and loud, called cockroaches. Now every drop of her blood is telling her not to sign these papers. So she asks Solomon, would he tell her to sign if it were his grandmother? After a deafening silence, Solomon says to her that if it were his grandmother, he would tell her not to sign. Proud of her fellow Korean, Gyomja gets up proudly and doesn't sign. Afterwards, Tom blows up at Solomon for sabotaging the deal. That night, Sunja finally arrives in Korea and almost leaps from the car to walk onto the beautiful beach of her motherland. Back in the past, Sun Jia arrives in Osaka with Isak, with Isak's brother Yoseb, greeting them warmly at the station. After taking them to his neighborhood, Yoseb mentions there are spies everywhere, so to be careful. Eventually, he shows them his home, a quaint but organized affair. Kyung Hee, her sister-in-law, greets them in a beautiful floral robe, looking quite put together even though they are poor. That night, she serves them with white rice, causing Sun Jia to be reminded of back home and breaking into tears again. In 1989, Sun Jia is walking through a modern fish market in Busan and is overjoyed at the memories it brings, telling Mozasu about them as they come to her. Back in Tokyo, Solomon is being blackballed from every bank in Japan due to his support for Gyeongja. But he isn't worried because he plans to return to New York anyway. He then spots Naomi at the bar. She says she overheard him speaking to Hana and wondered what it meant, with him replying that he was starting to forget about her. But then she called again. She's been stuck in his heart ever since they met at 14. He immediately became obsessed with her, but it ended because he left for America. In 1931, Sun Jia and Isak become intimate after having a talk about how he feels more courageous with her and the idea of a child in his life. The following day, 
Sun Jia goes to help Kyung Hee with the laundry, but breaks down crying when she realizes the smell of home has been washed out of all her clothes. She asks when this ache will go away, and Kyung Hee says it doesn't. You simply have to endure it. Soon after, moneylenders come to their house asking for 320 yen back from a loan Yosip took out. Afraid of the loan shark, Sun Jia says she'll come up with the full amount. She then visits a pawn shop and haggles with the merchant to sell the pocket watch she got from Han Su. Managing to get its full value of 300 yen from him, they are able to pay back the loan. Not long after, Han Su buys back the watch from the merchant and tells him that she will pay dearly for having married a dreamer. In Busan 1989, Sun Jia scatters Kyung Hee's ashes into the sea and together with Moza Su goes to a parking garage roof next. Sun Jia says this is where her father was buried. At a government office, a bureaucrat finds a scrap of information about where her father's body was moved. She provides Sun Jia with a name, Shin Bok Hee, with Sun Jia having a flash of recognition. After ringing the doorbell of an apartment, they are greeted by an older woman. As they make eye contact, there is a mutual recognition and they share a warm embrace. Shin used to be a serving girl at her mother's boarding house and was deeply affected by Sun Jia's departure. The war further compounded their difficulties. The serving girls recognized the limited opportunities in their current situation and sought factory jobs in Manchuria. However, Shin eventually decided to return to Korea, while another serving girl named Dong Hee tragically took her own life in the river. After this visit, Sun Jia goes to her mother's grave and reminisces about how time has passed. She then asks Mosazu to take her back to Japan. Meanwhile, Solomon gets a call from Tom, who says he's getting fired. If that happens, Solomon worries he won't be able to keep his American visa. But before he can find a solution, Hana calls him and tells him that she doesn't want to die alone. In 1975, Hana and Solomon meet at school and hatch a plan to escape to America, disregarding their lack of money. Hana convinces Solomon to shoplift at a convenience store, but they are caught by a racist Japanese shopkeeper. At the police station, an officer threatens to involve Solomon's school, but his father intervenes and a phone call leads to Solomon being released. Despite Solomon's desire to stay with Hana, his father decides to send him to America. In 1989, Hana's parents received the devastating news of her AIDS diagnosis. With inadequate care at the hospital, a younger doctor suggests transferring her to another wing, as her life expectancy is estimated to be only a few weeks or months. Solomon finally reunites with Hana, finding her in a hospital bed, wearing sunglasses and drinking Coke. He proposes that she should go to America for better medical treatment, but she accuses him of not understanding the reality of her situation. Hana recalls how she dreamt of living in an American family when Solomon left for the States. She believed that American children wouldn't have the same empty feeling she experienced. However, her dream shattered when she contracted the disease from someone who embodied the heritage she once admired. She expresses her hope that Solomon will not become like those people, regardless of his wealth or material possessions. Later, Solomon packs his belongings at Shifley's, while Naomi watches with longing. After leaving the building, a man named Mamoru Yoshi approaches Solomon and hints towards a potential cooperation between them. Back in 1931, Sun Jia's water breaks prematurely, leaving Isak and Kyung Hee unsure of what to do. Meanwhile, Yosip spends his time drinking and boasts about his noble heritage at the bar, only to be disregarded. Isak then finds Yosip before a potential fight erupts and informs him that Sun Jia is in labor. Yosip refuses to join them, prompting Isak to sit down and drink with him, leading to a conversation about the challenges faced by their family and Koreans in general. Returning to 1989, Yoshi and Solomon converse in a taxi, with the former proposing the establishment of more pachinko parlors in the overseas market. Meanwhile, Sun Jia enters Hana's hospital room and reveals that Etsuko never gave up on her, even during her years of absence. However, Hana erupts in anger, blaming Sun Jia for the advice to send Solomon to America. Sun Jia clarifies that she was concerned about Solomon's well-being, not Hana's. Sometime later, Sun Jia arrives with a basket of food, and Solomon complains to her about losing his job due to her influence. However, Sun Jia shares that she too once rejected the opportunity for wealth. She understands Solomon's pain, but couldn't accept the accompanying life it would bring. In the past, Yoseb and Isak decide to go home after some drinking. At their house, Sun Jia gives birth to a baby boy, and Isak and Yoseb arrive shortly after. 
Isak holds Sunja's son, and she requests that Yoseb name the child. Yoseb, in tears, chooses the name Noah. In his luxurious Japanese home, Hansu finally confesses to his wife that he fathered a child with another woman. In 1923, a young Hansu and his father Zhang Yul attend a crowded sports fight when they are approached by Ryoichi, Zhang Yul's Japanese boss. Ryoichi inquires about Hansu's mathematical skills, as his father claims he is exceptional in that regard. However, his father wants another life for him and quickly states he already has a job as a math tutor for the wealthy American Holmes family. The following day, Hansu and his father sit on a hill, enjoying meat skewers from a small barbecue while overlooking a baseball game. His father discusses the importance of specializing in one area of life and asserts that Hansu is unlikely to choose something mundane like fishing. Hansu, confident in his abilities, believes he can make it in America, the land of opportunity. Although his father is initially skeptical, he eventually becomes convinced that Hansu should go, as he believes his son will encounter opportunities he himself never had. Back at the fighting arena, Hansu overhears a conversation between his father and Ryoichi, who is requesting repayment of a loan. Hansu later learns that his father has given the money to a woman he has been seeing. When they confront the woman, she reveals that she has already given the money to another man, playing his father for a fool. Han Su suggests borrowing the money from Mr. Holmes, but his father worries that doing so may jeopardize Han Su's chances of going to America, something he cannot allow. In the ensuing argument, Han Su's father violently beats him, instructing him to kill his father in his heart and never return back to him. When his father meets with Ryoichi again, Han Su interrupts their meeting and offers to work off the debt himself. However, his father insists that only he should be punished and pleads with Ryoichi. Suddenly, a massive earthquake strikes, causing chaos. Hansu is knocked unconscious, and in a desperate attempt to save him, his father is struck by a falling beam and dies. When Hansu regains consciousness, he finds Ryoichi, and together they witness the extensive damage to the city. Going to the mountains for safety, they soon overlook the ruined city. Hansu asks whether Ryoichi would have killed his father, to which Ryoichi affirms and advises Hansu to follow the American family. Hansu then meets with the Holmes family as they prepare to leave and helps them navigate through the ruins. However, in the chaotic streets, he becomes separated from Mrs. Holmes and Andrew, leaving him in a state of desperation. Ryoichi then appears, and together, they run to safety. That night, Hansu discovers the lifeless body of Mrs. Holmes and Andrew, and inside Mrs. Holmes's shirt, he finds the pocket watch. At a roadside bar, they overhear rumors about 300 violent Korean prisoners having escaped and witness the spread of other hateful rumors. Ryoichi realizes that these rumors are meant to incite hatred towards Koreans and confronts those spreading them. Due to these rumors, Ryoichi is forced to hide Hansu from a Japanese mob, searching for Koreans. He also helps some Koreans hide in a nearby barn and with the assistance of a compassionate man, tries to divert the mob's attention elsewhere. However, their efforts fail, and the mob sets fire to the barn, burning the Koreans alive, while Han Su helplessly watches in horror from his hiding place. Continuing their journey, Ryoichi and Han Su reunite with Ryoichi's wife and children, and Ryoichi invites Han Su to live with them, assuring him that he will take care of him. Late at night, when everyone is asleep, Han Su looks up at the stars, then over to the ruins of Yokohama in the dawn's early light. In Osaka, 1938, Noah is picked up from school by Isak. When the following day, Noah is not picked up from school, he returns to his mother. Together, they visit the church only to witness officers raiding it. Here, Sunja soon learns about Isak's arrest and quickly instructs Noah to seek Yosef's help, interrupting his work back at a biscuit factory. In 1989, Hana is surrounded by doctors, and Etsuko asks one of them if the end is near, receiving confirmation to prepare for the inevitable. Meanwhile, Solomon reveals to his father that he can no longer return to America to work, but believes that Yoshi can assist him. However, his father distrusts Yoshi due to the negative influence of Yoshi's grandfather. In 1938, Yoseb tries to bribe an officer at the police station to release Isak, but the attempt fails. Yoseb decides to seek help from his boss. Meanwhile, Sunja encounters another woman who reveals that Isak is part of an underground movement. Shocking Sunja. At work, Yoseb's boss fires him upon learning about Isak's political involvement, considering Yoseb's blood dangerous. In Hana's hospital room, 
She asks Solomon to care for her mother and admits her fear. Hannah reflects on their difficult lives and urges Solomon to embrace everything for her sake. He then meets with Yoshi to plan a scheme against Shifley's, involving Gyomja selling them her property, which they can sell back to Shifley's at a higher price. In the past, Noah and Sunja meet a resistance movement leader through the woman they encountered earlier at the police station. Sunja learns that Isak kept their world separate to protect her, and that they are communist activists. Upon hearing this, she confronts them angrily, blaming their ideals for her family's troubles. However, police then storm the house and arrest everyone. Sunja endures interrogation and denies any involvement. After being released, she and Noah see Isak being transported. Noah desperately tries to reach him, but the officers restrain him as the car drives away. They chase after the car, but eventually lose sight of it. On Hannah's deathbed, she requests to see Solomon, and he arrives just in time. He bursts into Hannah's room, taking her bed out of the hospital for one last journey. Once outside, he places a flower necklace around her, fulfilling her desire to die in Hawaii, with Hannah smiling. After Hana is wheeled back to her room, Sunja presents the pocket watch she had sold to save the family and offers it to Solomon. Meanwhile, Gyomja is studying when she hears a dog barking. Investigating the commotion, she glimpses one of Yoshi's henchmen with his dogs and quickly retreats into her house, locking the door. Back in 1938, Sunja and Noah lie awake in their room. Sunja retrieves her mother's rings and assures Noah she will take care of everything. While Sunja and Kyung Hee prepare a large batch of kimchi the next day, Noah is approached by Han Su, his biological father. He urges Noah to surpass everyone and be better than both the Japanese and Koreans, and then hands him the pocket watch. Soon after, Sunja takes the kimchi to the market, where people insult her due to its strong smell. However, a kind merchant offers her a stall next to him, and gradually, she begins to sell her kimchi, growing more confident and enthusiastic as she gains her first customers. Thank <laughs> you.